Hello, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, What You Need to Know About COVID-19 and MS, Program 9. I am Andrea Griffin, Vice President of Communications and Marketing for MSAA, and your host for tonight's program. On behalf of MSAA and our presenters, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to keep you updated on this very important topic, and please know that we hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy during these challenging times. MSA is extremely honored to once again welcome back our two MS expert advisors who will update us about the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on MS and answer your questions during our Q&A session. At this time, I would like to introduce our special guest presenters, Dr. Barry Hendon, and Dr. Carrie Hirsch. Dr. Perry Hendon is a practicing neurologist, MSAA's Chief Medical Officer, and Director of the MS Center of Arizona. He is also the Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Clinic at Banner University Medical Center and Clinical Professor of Neurology at the University of Arizona Medical School. Dr. Carrie Hirsch is a practicing neurologist and the Chair of MSAA's Healthcare Advisory Council. Dr. Hirsch is an assistant professor of neurology for the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you both again so much for being here tonight and providing us with such timely and important information about COVID-19 and the FDA-approved vaccines. And Andrea, I'm sure I speak for Dr. Hirsch as well as myself when I tell you how pleased we are to present the ninth uh, version of uh, this discussion on COVID-19. Uh, and uh, uh, the advice for people with MS. Uh, we're pleased to be back again and honored to be back again uh, working with MSAA. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hendon. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank our supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Sanofi Genzyme for making this webinar series possible. Also, tonight's program includes our new virtual display hall. The link can be found in the chat box. This online resource details some of the products and patient assistance services offered by our sponsors. MSA would like to thank Biogen, Genentech, and Sanofi Genzyme for taking part in this new virtual opportunity. As you may know, MSA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today for the MS community. And listed here are just some of the many free programs available to the MS community including our COVID-19 and MS Pathfinder digital tool, which provides ongoing updates and resources on the coronavirus. Also, please note that MSAA has expanded our helpline hours to 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern between Mondays and Thursdays. To learn more about our program, please visit mymsaa.org or give us a call at 1-800-532-7667. And lastly, please know that tonight's webinar will be archived on our website within just a few days. For the Q&A session, please type your questions into the chat box on the screen and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Also, if you're having any technical issues, please type your concerns into the chat box as well. So at this time, I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Barry Hendon, who will kick off tonight's presentation. Dr. Hendon? Thank you, Andrea. Um, I, th I suppose uh, in the midst of a great deal of change, uh, I'd like to comment on those things which uh, have remained true since the very first uh, discussion that uh, Dr. Hirsch and I had with you, and that is <clears throat> the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19 is a highly contagious and potentially serious inflammatory disorder that affects or targets the respiratory system system, but uh, there are also uh, a number of neurological complications that have occurred. And those have included strokes and seizures and encephalopathies. Um, uh, so uh, it, it is targeting the respiratory system, but it does not exclude uh, risk to the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Just as we said in the very first occasion, the way to minimize risk then and now, wearing a mask. Uh, washing your hands, practicing social distancing when possible, and then the things that we call prehabilitation, uh, the ways that you keep yourself healthy so that if you were to uh, uh, get uh, COVID-19, 
you'd be in the best possible shape and, and have uh, the best uh, likely outcomes. That means uh, getting your weight to uh, a more ideal weight, exercising regularly, stopping smoking, and getting your medical conditions, if it's diabetes or kidney disease, uh, under best control. We said before and continue to say, having MS does not in and of itself create increased risk for COVID-19. However, uh, marked disability does. And so although we want to assure people with MS that uh, the diagnosis of MS does not innately or in and of itself uh, create risk, uh, we do recognize that increasing disability uh, uh, increase in progressive MS is associated with some greater risk. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn this over to Dr. Hirsch. Thank you so much, Dr. Hendon. And uh, before I start uh, addressing the, uh, the next three points, I, I would like to echo uh, Dr. Hendon's uh, message to the MSAA and all of our sponsors, um, you know, how pleased and honored we are uh, to be with you all this evening in helping to answer your very clinically relevant questions when it comes to navigating the COVID-19 pandemic and how best to navigate uh, vaccination uh, in MS. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy to be with all of you, and we certainly welcome your questions. This program is designed to be for you all, uh, so please keep them coming. Um, so to move on to uh, the third bullet point on this slide, um, I, I just want to mention that, you know, over the past year, we have learned a lot about um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the uh, viral infection that has caused uh, the COVID-19 syndrome. Uh, we have learned things, uh, and there's still things that we still don't know, and it's still, um, uh, a, a learning and process in, uh, in, in the scientific community. But certain things uh, we still continue to know as true. And one of them is uh, what risk factors um, increase someone's risk, not only for uh, becoming susceptible or, or um, actually transmitting the virus um, and actually uh, presenting with symptoms of COVID-19, uh, but also having increased risk of more severe disease. Some of those things are folks who are older in years, so 60 years of age and older, and those with other uh, certain health conditions, otherwise known as comorbidities. I know that we have used that uh, word quite a bit uh, throughout all of our iterations of the MSAA programs, but uh, in, in this respect, we are predominantly uh, referring to uh, vascular comorbidities such as um, uh, heart disease or chronic lung disease, diabetes, uncontrolled high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, um, obesity, and uh, in addition to what Dr. Hendon had mentioned before is, you know, chronic disability that may increase someone's susceptibility of um, actually acquiring a, a chronic viral infection. So we do understand that those things continue to be increased risk factors for our patients with and without MS and um, can increase um, um, uh, you know, disparities uh, in health. Um, and we continue to see this uh, across the board. Another important thing to note is that um, we do generally recommend that disease-modifying therapies should not be stopped or changed unless this has been clearly discussed with your MS healthcare provider. And the reason for that is because we know that MS is a chronic, uh, lifelong, at least for now, uh, neurological condition that can cause irreversible disability. And remaining on disease-modifying therapies continues to be very important and folks who are uh, deemed appropriate to be on a disease-modifying therapy by their MS healthcare provider. So please, um, if you are um, considering or questioning any changes to your disease-modifying therapy, uh, please make sure you are having that conversation with your healthcare provider first. Um, we certainly do not want to increase the risk of any further MS disease activity and irreversible accumulation of disability. 
Um, currently, um, there are three FDA-approved vaccines for COVID-19. Um, two of them are mRNA vaccines. One of them is a vector vaccine. Um, they do differ um, slightly in terms of their mechanism of action and how it provokes our own immune system to developing an immunization response. Um, the administration in terms of timing is a little different um, and how many doses are required is also a little bit different. So for example, for Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, uh, they are both considered mRNA vaccines. Uh, they are both two part uh, vaccine, vaccines as well. Uh, Moderna separated in time by four weeks and Pfizer separated in time by three weeks. Uh, the uh, process of being stored and handled, it does differ between the two, uh, but in terms of how they work and how well they work, uh, there's no significant difference between them. Uh, the third vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is a vector vaccine, uh, meaning that um, a, a, an inactivated, very, very benign um, uh, virus uh, actually helps um, uh, bring the proper information to our own immune cells so that way we can create an antibody response. Um, overall, it is very difficult to compare the effectiveness of the vaccines with each other just because they were tested during different times in different patient populations. So uh, we're usually not cross comparing them all three of them are considered to be effective and can be used safely in MS and on disease-modifying therapies. Um, there certainly have been some questions in terms of the uh, safety of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a one-time vaccination. Um, because of the um, uh, recent um, placement on hold by the CDC and the FDA, uh, because of a handful of clotting cases um, that did occur. Uh, however, they were deemed to be very, uh, very rare, occurring only uh, uh, one in a million and are now um, fully available once again. And we can certainly answer any further questions that come up regarding that uh, later in the session. So <clears throat> this is the uh, the crux, I think, of, of what many people would uh, uh, be concerned about, and that is um, the safety of uh, COVID-19 in people with MS. Um, I, I think Dr. Hirsch and I have had this discussion with each other, uh, and, and overall, um, COVID-19 vaccinations appear to be safe for people with MS, and that means all of the available um, vaccines. Uh, there is nothing about MS which makes any one of them more hazardous uh, for people with MS. Um, and in that regard, we consider COVID-19 to be the most serious threat uh, uh, in the United States and in the world uh, in terms of immediate threat. And so we have recommended that people with MS should, by and large, uh, take the first available vaccine regardless of the brand. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, their, the concern has been uh, in young women uh, with a particular clotting disorder, which is a cerebral venous thrombosis or clotting uh, in the vasculature of the brain. Uh, it's been rare enough, one in a million, that it is actually much less likely to have a clotting disorder uh, from the Johnson & Johnson than from COVID-19. So really, uh, my recommendations to my patients and my recommendation in general is uh, get the vaccine, get the vaccine as early as you possibly can, uh, and you take the one that's available to you. I, I say you show up and they tell you to show up, you roll up your sleeves, and you take the injection that's offered with rare exception. Dr. Hirsch? Thank you. Um, so the next uh, bullet point um, is a discussion on the timing of the COVID vaccines with disease-modifying therapies. And um, this has certainly become a, 
um, highly relevant and um, um, you know popular question that has come up during our uh, previous iterations of, of this program. And um, fortunately, um, uh, over the past few months, um, there have been some clear guidelines that have come out that have been shared across the MS scientific community. Um, and it is a, um, um, a shared uh, um, uh, opinion and advice that is coming from the National MS Society, the MS Association of America, and the Consortium of MS Centers. Um, and it is available on the National MS Society website. Um, uh, most of the disease-modifying therapies that are considered our uh, platform therapies, um, um, certain uh, oral disease-modifying therapies such as um, Abagio, our Fumarate, Texadera, uh, Vumerity, and one of our highly effective therapies, Tysabri, uh, we are generally not recommending um, any specific timing in terms of COVID vaccine and the timing of the disease-modifying therapies because we don't anticipate that the mechanism of action behind those individual therapies are going to have um, any implications in the effectiveness of the vaccine. I do want to preface that despite any recommendations on the timing of the COVID vaccine, it's more specifically aimed for as high of um, an effectiveness when it comes to vaccination and the ability for the immune system to mount that immunization, that vaccination response, versus any preconceived notions of adverse effects or side effects or safety issues when it comes to getting the COVID-19 vaccine and disease-modifying therapy. So again, this is so that the individual who is on certain disease-modifying therapies are able to mount as, as an appropriate response as possible. There are certain disease-modifying therapies, however, that we may recommend some specific timing um, when it comes to getting the COVID-19 vaccine and um, having one of the disease-modifying therapies administered. Um, a very um, uh, common question that has come up through our previous iterations of MSAA is the um, ocrelizumab or ocrevus disease-modifying therapies. Um, and, and one of the reasons is because it is quite a popular disease-modifying therapy that is being used um, in the United States, but also because we do have um, some data in the MS scientific community stemming from previous work on other vaccines, such as the influenza vaccine and the Tdap vaccine, and we're able to leverage some of that information on what we anticipate will be an effective immune response to the COVID-19 vaccine. With that being said, um, to Dr. Hendon's point, we are recommending vaccination as early and as soon as possible. However, in certain circumstances, um, when it is deemed safe by the MS healthcare provider, uh, there are some specific um, languages that are being used in terms of timing. So in my practice and in some other similar practices, we recommend that um, waiting for at least um, three months or 12 weeks after the most recent um, uh, ocrevus infusion and at least two to four weeks um, after the uh, most recent COVID-19 vaccine before the next ocrevus infusion is given, we'll be able to provide um, um, a, a, a relatively um, good immune response and again, we are taking um, a lot of this data from previous work that has been done with other vaccines. Um, we do anticipate that there will be work specifically looking at the COVID-19 vaccine, so that way we can have a better indication of what that immune response is really looking like and how that also translates to clinical response. So meaning that, um, is a patient um, still at a decreased risk of developing active infection through COVID-19 after the vaccine was given in patients who were treated with those specific disease-modifying therapies? 
Um, there are other classes of disease-modifying therapies where we may recommend if someone is about to start a disease-modifying therapy, we may ask for the individual to wait about two to four weeks from the last COVID-19 vaccine before they start their disease-modifying therapy. But again, that conversation can be had more um, um, individually uh, with the healthcare provider when deciding on the best timing. Um, at the at the end of the talk today, we'll certainly be able to answer more specific questions that people have when it comes to individual DMTs or classes of DMTs. But overall, um, you know, the guidelines are stating that we do want to go ahead and vaccinate our patients as soon as possible, and they can do so safely on disease-modifying therapies. Thank you. The, the next bullet point, the next question uh, asks, uh, in essence, uh, is it uh, possible or likely that uh, the COVID-19 vaccination will cause an MS relapse? Uh, and, and the answer here is that it's highly unlikely that a COVID-19 vaccine will cause an MS relapse. Um, what may happen, on the other hand, is that if uh, uh, you have a febrile or fever reaction to the uh, vaccination, you may have what's called a pseudo relapse, and that is when just temperature elevation in and of itself heightens old MS symptomatology. An example would be a person who had, had uh, optic neuritis a year or two or three or 15 years ago who winds up uh, getting the vaccine, mounts a fever, uh, and then gets some blurring briefly while the fever uh, is present. That's uh, uh, called Utoff phenomenon, or it's one of the forms of Utoff phenomenon, uh, and, and really is a, a, about a transient uh, change in conduction uh, with fever. It's not a real relapse. Uh, and should get a, uh, should uh, uh, resolve uh, once the temperature is returned to normal. Uh, I always say to myself as well that uh, uh, if uh, you already have uh, discomfort and a little weakness and a little malaise, uh, sometimes the, the COVID-19 vaccination will increase that. I found, at least experientially, uh, the older you are, the uh, in general, uh, the less profound your reaction is to the COVID-19 vaccination. The younger you are, the, uh, the, and the, therefore the more powerful your immune response, the more likely you to have some symptomatology. But to the question, is it likely or unlikely that the COVID-19 vaccination will cause uh, an MS relapse? Answer, highly unlikely. Dr. Hirsch. Thank you. And the last bullet point on this slide, the currently approved vaccines are considered effective in terms of protection against COVID-19. And we are anticipating that periodic vaccine boosters will be required in the future. So as we had mentioned in the past, um, while we do anticipate that there will be, um, or there is some level of innate immunity when someone has naturally acquired the COVID-19 infection, or whether or not they receive immunity through a COVID-19 vaccine, the person's immune response will be able to recognize that strain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which again is the virus that produces the COVID-19 infection. However, we still don't have a very good understanding for how long that immunity lasts for. And once someone has actually received the COVID-19 vaccine, how well um, it will be able to prevent transmission from one person to another, which is one of the reasons that the CDC still mandates that after we get the COVID-19 vaccine that we still wear masks out in public. And there are um, aggressive research efforts that are being conducted through the NIH currently to be able to answer that question better by looking essentially at viral load in the nasopharynxes of patients who um, have had the COVID-19 vaccine versus those who haven't. And are those patients 
decreasing the rate of transmission to other individuals. And if we are able to see that through this robust work, then in the future, we may be able to start decreasing the prevalent use of mass moving forward. But in terms of the periodic vaccine booster, um, we really don't know how often at this point. There have been some um, uh, theories that it might be annual, uh, very similar to the seasonal influenza vaccine. But right now, we simply don't know because we don't have the data su to support it. But once we have more information on how long that immunity lasts for, we'll be able to get some more information. Uh, next, in terms of frequently asked questions, um, can the side effects of COVID vaccine trigger MS symptoms? I think that's uh, the, uh, uh, the answer that I gave previously, and that is, um, uh, although the COVID vaccination won't cause an MS attack, um, or it's highly uh, unlikely to do so, it can, it can increase symptoms transiently. The symptoms may be due to fever, the symptoms may be due to just uh, the, the discomfort that some people feel diffusely, uh, the flu-like syndrome associated with vaccination. Uh, but it should be transient. And if there is good news, uh, to the extent that one has a more vigorous um, response to the COVID vaccination with, symptom, uh, symptom, uh, with respect to symptomatology, uh, that also means that they've probably had a very vigorous immune response. Dr. Hirsch. Thank you, Dr. Hendon. So the next bullet point, do you have any tips on how to minimize the side effects of the COVID vaccine? Um, well, to, um, uh, to reiterate what Dr. Hendon had said previously uh, regarding um, the emergence of side effects and symptoms after receiving the COVID-19 vaccine that this is reflective of your immune system actually responding to the vaccine and mounting that immunization response that you actually want. So um, Dr. Hendon had said previously that um, the stronger your immune system responds, then the more side effects you're likely to have. And that's why people get side effects when they get um, not just the COVID-19 vaccine, but, but any vaccine, including the influenza vaccine. Um, usually it's just conservative care um, in terms of um, how to maybe manage some of the side effects of the COVID vaccine. Um, generally speaking, I'm not recommending to my patients to pre-treat. Um, meaning, you know, taking acetaminophen or ibuprofen prior to the vaccine. We don't really have any robust data to suggest that it's really going to be all that effective. However, if one does develop a low-grade fever or chills or body aches, then one can take um, over-the-counter acetaminophen or ibuprofen uh, to try to minimize some of those side effects and make someone feel a little bit more comfortable. And the next question, I think, is perhaps one of the simplest. It says, are the vaccines safe for people with primary progressive MS? The answer here is uh, the vaccines are safe for people with all varieties of MS, from CIS, the clinically isolated syndrome, through relapsing forms of MS, through secondarily progressive MS, and primary progressive MS. So the, the simple answer is uh, for primary progressive MS and all other forms, the vaccine is safe. So the next question, if I experience side effects from the flu shot, should I get the COVID vaccine? Um, so, you know, to the, um, to the response to the second bullet point, um, again, the side effects are manifestations of your immune response actually responding to the vaccine. So because you got side effects from the flu shot, that means that your immune response is doing what it needs to be doing. And so, yes, someone uh, would certainly be able to get the COVID vaccine if they get side effects with the flu shot. And then next question. Uh, I've received my COVID vaccine. I've been home since the beginning of the pandemic. Is it safe for me to go out and see friends and family now? And, and the answer here is, 
it, that if you continue to practice good health habits, uh, uh, getting the COVID vaccine should be uh, uh, something that allows you to resume uh, some of your normal functions. It, but it still requires you to <clears throat> practice the same safe habits that we discussed at the beginning. <clears throat> so do not uh, attend large gatherings. Um, uh, continue to wash your hands. Continue to wear a mask. Um, it, it, some of the uh, events that uh, I think people are uh, beginning to re-engage uh, would be dining on patios at safe distances um, uh, and to a lesser extent in restaurants inside uh, and certainly not uh, in close quarters. So the answer is, I think we've begun to uh, re-emerge uh, to the extent that, that we are increasingly a vaccinated population. If you're vaccinated, I think you can get together with, with friends and family in small groups, particularly out of doors, uh, but it does not mean you forget the elemental safe habits uh, that the CDC began recommending in the first place. Dr. Hirsch. Okay, so the second uh, bullet point on the slide, uh, should we drink more water than average following the COVID vaccine to keep side effects to a minimum? And actually, this is, this is a, a, a very astute question. Um, so the best way that I can answer is it doesn't hurt to be well hydrated. So when folks are um, either uh, fighting an infection or feeling unwell, whenever you go to the doctor, the doctor will say, drink more water, drink more fluids. It will flush your system out. Um, in, th in this particular case, it actually um, may have an additional benefit by drinking more water will help keep the core body temperature cooler and may be able to help prevent um, a higher fever. Um, and as we had talked about before, when folks with MS have any kind of increase in core body temperature, even as little as a half a degree increase in temperature, uh, folks can actually have a resurgence of previous um, MS symptoms called an UTOPS phenomenon that Dr. Hendon had previously mentioned. And drinking more water may actually be able to help decrease that core body temperature, just as we are recommending to keep cool and drink cold water during hot summer months to prevent that UTOPS phenomenon. So that actually might be some good advice, and it certainly does not hurt to keep well hydrated. The next question is, uh, is there data showing that the COVID vaccine stimulates the immune system of a person with MS? The answer is yes, but I, I want to carry that a little further. It stimulates the immune system uh, against uh, the COVID-19 virus. So it's a very specific immune response. Um, there is a humoral response, which is antibodies, there's a cellular response, uh, which is T cells. Those uh, responses are very specific and focused on the, vac uh, on the, uh, the virus itself. That does not increase the general immune response in the way that would endanger people with MS, which is to say uh, the immune response to myelin of the central nervous system. So it is an increase in, in the immunity in a very focused way uh, but not in a way that is harmful or dangerous regarding MS. And last question before we move on to the live Q&A. Is there any evidence showing which vaccine is better for people with MS? So as, we, uh, so as Dr. Hendon and I had both mentioned uh, during earlier slides, uh, the best vaccine is the vaccine that you can get the soonest. Um, there are no data showing that um, any vaccine is better for people with MS over another one. Um, they are all considered effective. They are all considered safe in individuals with MS and on disease modifying therapies. So the best vaccine for an individual to get is the one that is made available to you at the infusion center or the vaccination center. Andrea, before we begin to answer the questions that have been asked, 
There's one that is a little close to home that I thought I might answer out of turn um, and, and then turn it over to you to ask, uh, ask us the questions that you would. And that is someone from Sierra Vista, Arizona, uh, uh, which is in my backyard, uh, says, my MS support group meets at a restaurant. I know some members of this group are not vaccinated. Should I be concerned? And the answer is, um, if you are vaccinated, it offers a degree of protection. Um, but in fact, um, uh, I recommend against large gatherings inside restaurants, uh, particularly in groups that are not vaccinated. The primary risk to those people um, is to each other. Uh, so if there's a group who are not vaccinated, uh, the primary risk is each to each other, uh, that one va unvaccinated person to the other. Uh, it's not you who uh, are at the greatest risk. It's they who are at the greatest risk. Uh, should I be concerned? The answer is yes, but primarily uh, in, a, in a community uh, responsible way, and that is concern for the others. Andrea, I turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hendon, for addressing that question. And thank you um, to Dr. Hirsch as well, to both of you, for really covering a wealth of information. You have already addressed so many questions, um, many of which came through on our uh, registration form for the, for the webinar. So thank you for covering so much information. As you both can see, there are still a lot of questions coming through um, on the chat feature. So I will just run through some of these. We did receive a question from someone saying that they have secondary progressive MS and have been on eight different DMTs in the past 22 years. I am not on any DMT currently. My question is, is the vaccine safe for me? Uh, Dr. Hirsch, I'll try to answer that and then I'll, let, I'll sort of turn the others over to you uh, in turn. Um, yes, we, we recommend the vaccination really for people on disease-modifying therapy, for people not on disease-modifying therapy, for the young and for the old. Uh, so for people with uh, progressive and, and people for active disease, it, it really is uh, a recommendation across the ages and across the medications uh, and across the disease types. Um, uh, COVID-19 is a serious uh, uh, epidemic, a serious pandemic, uh, and, and a serious individual threat. Uh, vaccination reduces that threat, and uh, I think Dr. Hirsch and I strongly recommend vaccination. Yes, I, I concur. I have, I have nothing further to add. Um, I absolutely agree with Dr. Hendon's response. Great. Thank you both. Um, another question came through, and it's specific to um, one of the particular vaccines. Uh, this person is asking, is the Moderna vaccine more favorable for people of color compared to the other two vaccines? That's actually a great question, and it, uh, it leads to the issue of health disparities in, in care especially in the United States. And we have predominantly, and maybe even more so with this particular virus compared to other viruses, uh, have seen an explosion of that level of um, health disparity um, and social determinants of health um, over the past year. And specifically, we have been seeing that uh, people of color um, either folks who are black, uh, folks who are uh, Latino, Latina. We've, we've been seeing um, other folks of, of, of color, um, uh, Native Americans who have specifically been suffering from this pandemic uh, more so than un other individuals. Um, some of that may have to do with um, folks who are working as um, frontline workers. Uh, where they may have a higher propensity for being exposed to the virus. Uh, some of them might actually be related to um, uh, suboptimally controlled comorbidities that may also increase risk of um, transmission and acquiring the, uh, the virus as well, including uncontrolled diabetes, high blood pressure, 
and heart and lung disease. With that being said, um, we have not um, seen uh, through the data that any of the individual vaccines do a better job of creating an equitable immune response across different races and ethnicities. So the, the answer to that question would be even in folks of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, um, in minority populations, we do not anticipate that there is going to be um, an inequitable biological response to the Moderna vaccine versus the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine versus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, where the disparity in care is access to these vaccines. And that is a huge call to the United States healthcare system that I, I'm, I'm very much hoping that over the years we will be able to address more aggressively. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Dr. Hendon, I'm sorry, did you want to add? No, just an agreement, and that is um, uh, uh, what you're hearing from Dr. Hirsch and from me uh, is across ethnicities, across ages, across types of MS, um, our call is um, get vaccinated um, even uh, in a society that has uh, some reluctance. I speak to a group of patients uh, uh, every day, uh, and uh, people still come in saying, I'm not, uh, although most of my patients have been vaccinated, uh, some say uh, I'm suspicious and I'm concerned. I'm not so sure I should take anything. Um, my strong message is, uh, that uh, you take uh, the agent that's available, uh, be it Moderna or Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson, and you take it uh, as soon as you can, uh, and that we'll try to, uh, if we need to adjust medications, we do so, uh, but uh, uh, get vaccinated, get vaccinated as soon as possible with the agent that's available. It's a strong call. Thank you both. Um, so the next question, um, is the COVID shot known to affect the lymph nodes? <laughs> so uh, the, the, immune, the, the lymph nodes are part of the immune system, uh, and one could have some lymph node swelling uh, with vaccination, uh, but, not to neg but not otherwise. Uh, any inflammatory response may affect the lymph nodes. Uh, any uh, immune response may affect the lymph nodes, but not in some negative way. Great, thank you, Dr. Hendon. Someone was asking about side effects after getting vaccinated, and if that means that uh, the immune system is reacting properly to the vaccine, and on the other hand, if I don't get side effects, does this mean that the vaccine is not working? That's, that's actually a really great question, and um, I, I, I take that as um, a, a very astute question, kind of following up on the conversations that Dr. Henson and I were having uh, earlier during this program. Um, theoretically, um, we would anticipate a stronger immune response in younger and healthier individuals. And because of that, they may be more likely to manifest the side effects that we had discussed before. However, if you do not experience any side effects, that does not mean that you are not mounting any immune response. Um, and I would anticipate that there is still an, uh, a level of immune response that is occurring. How much of that is in comparison to other people who are actually mounting sensitive symptoms, we don't have the answer to that uh, because we don't have any uh, data um, with COVID-19 um, to be able to answer that um, with evidence-based science. But I would anticipate that whether or not an individual is developing side effects or not, um, as long as they are getting the COVID-19 vaccine, there will be a level of protection that is above and beyond if an individual was not vaccinated at all. 
Great, thank you for addressing that, Dr. Hirsch. Our next question, is there more known about vaccine efficacy in people on B cell therapies? Um, and and uh, Dr. Hirsch has kind of alluded to this already, so uh, I'll take a stab at this. I think it's been uh, partially answered, but there are therapies that affect the B cells, um, and uh, one thinks of uh, ocrelizumab, one thinks of rituximab, uh, one thinks of uh, opatumumab. Uh, those are, uh, if we use the common names, I guess, Rituxan, um, uh, Ocrevus, and uh, Kazemta. Those are primarily B cell strategies, and, um, and that means that the B cell responses and the humoral responses, the antibody responses, will be muted. Um, it, it, we, we believe that the cellular response, the T cell response, is still sufficient so that people on B cell strategies, for example, or B cell therapies, for example, still amount a sufficient immune response. Um, it may be muted, but it is still an immune response. And as Dr. Hirschgott's on saying, uh, it puts you uh, in the group of people who have been vaccinated. Uh, you may not have uh, the full immune response that someone else has had, but it is sufficient to reduce the likelihood of serious illness or death. Uh, and therefore, we recommend it in all. Great, thank you, Dr. Hendon. Someone has asked, I'm currently in the process of switching DMT therapy. At this point, I'm currently not on any MS medication. Would it be better to take the vaccine now prior to starting a new DMT therapy or wait until after I start? They added, I'm 62 and had COVID in December 2020. Fortunately, mild. No, that, that, that's a, another great question. Um, so it, it really, to, to answer that question, we, we do recommend um, getting vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, if the individual is in a position where it is not urgent to start a disease-modifying therapy right away, and there is some time for the individual to go ahead and get vaccinated, it may be easier to start the COVID-19 vaccination process before starting a disease-modifying therapy, especially if one is being considered that has the possibility of blunting some of that immune response. Typically, with the majority of the disease-modifying therapies where we are recommending uh, that there might be a small gap or a small window in between the last COVID-19 vaccine and the first administration of a new disease-modifying therapy, that window is about two to four weeks. It's not with every disease-modifying therapy, but it's with some of our immunosuppressive therapies, our B-cell depleting therapies, and some of our trafficking disease-modifying therapies as well. So I would say that, again, if it is not urgent to start a disease-modifying therapy right away, it may be easier to complete the COVID-19 vaccination process before starting a disease-modifying therapy, especially if the vaccine is readily available to the individual. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. Someone had asked, do I still need to wear a mask? after getting vaccinated? Yes. <laughs> Short and very, sweet, right? A, a, a very, that was the most abbreviated response I have given yet. Um, but, but, but the simple and albeit curt response is yes. And, and the reason for that is because we have yet to um, solidify whether or not individuals who have been vaccinated can still transmit the virus to other individuals who are unprotected, who have not been vaccinated yet. And as I mentioned earlier, there are concerted efforts being made at the level of the NIH in conducting a research study evaluating patients who have been vaccinated versus those who have not, and being able to identify viral shedding, and is there a difference between people who have been vaccinated and those who have not? So remember that wearing a mask is to protect 
others, is to protect the community, not necessarily you being protected against other people. So that is why we are still recommending to wear masks even after you have gotten the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. We have a question, um, cognition-related question. Someone had asked, is brain fog associated with COVID? The person explained um, that he or she recovered from COVID about three weeks ago, and this seems to have worsened. Sure, and I can, so I think Dr. Hirsch and I have talked previously about what uh, gets called the long hauler syndrome or the long haul syndrome. That is, uh, even people who have recovered from mild uh, COVID-19 may continue to have symptoms uh, for a while thereafter. Uh, that uh, I've seen that in my own practice, and certainly that's been true uh, in the literature. Uh, people uh, who have had a loss of smell, a sense of smell, or, uh, may continue to have some decrease in their sense of smell for some months uh, after recovery. People who have had fatigue or increased fatigue or shortness of breath may continue to have that for a period of time thereafter. Uh, uh, the two that I've seen the most commonly have been increased levels of fatigue and brain fog uh, as part of the long haul syndrome. Uh, it's not entirely clear why and whom uh, uh, that, uh, that occurs, uh, why some individuals uh, have more severe uh, COVID-19 and no prolonged symptoms, and others have mild COVID-19 and more prolonged symptoms. But there's clearly a group uh, who continue to have uh, symptoms varying from loss of sense of smell to fatigue, uh, to brain fog, to shortness of breath for a period of time thereafter, including months. Thank you for addressing that, Dr. Hendon. Someone had asked, and I thought this was um, an interesting question, and I, I know as we near the hour, I wanted to give both of you an opportunity to touch on any points that you really wanted to cover that we may, you know, may not have covered uh, during the hour. But someone had asked, what so far has been the most and least surprising for you to learn about COVID-19? Dr. Hirsch. Gosh, that's a great question. We're both silent because we're, I, I'm sure Dr. Hendon is thinking uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. the same, to the same extent that I am. That, that, that's a great question. Um, Dr. Hendon, if you have a ready answer, I might have to percolate on that a little bit. So I, I think uh, for me, the, the great surprise was how much COVID-19 has changed uh, society. Um, I, I knew that it was uh, going to be a virulent uh, virus in some individuals. I knew it would be infectious. Uh, I knew it would affect uh, people, uh, but I think it was uh, even a, a larger problem. Uh, and its effects were more than just uh, individual health. It was uh, people uh, who lost their employment, people uh, who uh, uh, lost their housing. Uh, it was really, for me, the, the, that A virus, uh, like von Economos of uh, encephalitis of 2000, I'm sorry, 1918, uh, it not just caused death and illness, but really changed society. It's also changed the practice of, of medicine, uh, the, 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 uh, the use of telehealth. Uh, that was really in its infancy uh, became much more prominent. It, it emphasized to me some of the things that Dr. Hirsch and I have felt so strongly about uh, all this time. So Dr. Hirsch has been one of the great proponents, great advocates for wellness. Uh, and, and, and this has brought that home. The people who have done the best are those who um, have paid attention to their general health and wellness, uh, who have kept their weight proportionate, who have kept their exercise pattern, uh, who have uh, tried to uh, maintain their abilities and their social connections. Um, uh, so for me, it is, uh, it is uh, both um, uh, an illness and a societal effect 
and a recognition of the old truths, including our need to maintain connectedness to each other uh, and best possible health and wellness, uh, independent of the viruses around us. It's good for MS. Uh, it's good for recovery from uh, COVID. No, that's a that's that's a fantastic response. Um, you know, as you were answering, I was you know thinking about you know what what have what have I learned? And maybe it's not necessarily answering what's the most surprising, but I, I do have to say that this this pandemic, this virus, has been um, very humbling. It has it it has. Um, highlighted that we still have a lot to learn uh, when it comes to certain kinds of viruses and how they act and how they mutate. Um, the coronavirus, um, you know, is, a, is a, quite the ubiquitous virus. It's the virus that causes the common cold. And I think what has been the most surprising for me is a virus that has come into play that has such a wide breadth of um, involvement when it comes to different organ systems. It not only um, involves the respiratory system, but it involves the cardiothoracic system. It involves the vascular system. It involves the neurological system. But not only that, but it's the, it's the breadth of involvement and the um, for, for lack of a better term, the, the scope of involvement. So there's some individuals who are asymptomatic, and there are individuals who develop very severe disease requiring ventilation, and some succumb to the, to the virus where, you know, we have over 540,000 people in the U.S. In the US alone who have, who have died from it. So I, I think that it's been a very humbling uh, year for us, but um, it, it has also, um, uh, you know, it, it's also uh, been an opportunity for us to learn more about each other and the MS scientific community um, and being able to build opportunities um, to learn more um, uh, about how these viruses replicate and how they act differently in different communities. Um, and, and I think that one really great thing that has come out of all of this is um, the, um, uh, the, the en enhancement of telehealth and telemedicine services and how we're able to um, access specialized care more easily. Um, so I, I think that there have been a lot of learning opportunities over the past year, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to learn more uh, from this moving forward. And Andrew, maybe one last thought, and that is um, uh, sort of building on, on uh, what Dr. Hurst said. Uh, it's been humbling, but it's also been a, a, an experience that has uh, allowed me to see um, with, with great pride um, how people rise to the occasion. So the 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 presence of vaccinations at such a great speed, uh, the rollout of those vaccinations to the country uh, at great speed after it was developed, the actions of individuals in terms of, of their supporting their communities, um, that means both healthcare workers and, and the wide variety of people in grocery stores and uh, in first uh, front line, uh, it's also brought to mind some of the strong not just some of the disparities and, and weaknesses of the system, but some of the nobility and strengths of the system, including uh, some of the nobility and strengths of individuals. So it, it to me, has been uh, uh, um, sometimes uh, humbling, but sometimes really um, um, uh, something that's evoked a, a great deal of, of uh, pride and, uh, uh, in terms of, of my fellow man, uh, and that is how much has been done in such a, such a small amount of time by, by so many people uh, in behalf of each other. Uh, so I, I really found something good from this very bad epidemic. Thank you, Dr. Hendon, and thank you, Dr. Hirsch, for a very thoughtful, very thoughtful responses um, in regards to that particular inquiry. I thought it was an interesting question and really appreciate your insights. So thank you both.
And we are now at the hour. So that concludes tonight's webinar, which will be archived on our website, mymsaa.org, within just a few days. I would like to once again thank Dr. Barry Hendon and Dr. Carrie Hirsch for keeping us updated on this very important issue. And thank you to our funding partners, Bristol Myers Squibb, EMD Serono, Genentech, Novartis, and Sanofi Genzyme for supporting this webinar series. Additionally, we would like to thank our virtual display hall sponsors, Bigen, Genentech, and Sanofi Genzyme. Finally, we would like to ask you to take a very brief survey that is coming up next. Your feedback is important to us and will help us secure funding for future programs. So on behalf of MSAA, Dr. Hendon and Dr. Hirsch, thank you so much for watching and please stay safe.